Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle HR Leadership Forum Tech Check 2022. My name is Michael with Argyle. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit the virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. And now without further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Nicole Sloan, Employee Experience Leader with Kimberly Clark. We're excited to have Nicole and our panelists with us for a panel discussion titled, Connect, Engage, Thrive, Tools and Techniques to Create a Fair and Inclusive Employee Experience. Nicole, Thank you for being here today and our panelists, welcome, over to you. Thanks, Michael. I'm really excited to be moderating this particular panel. I feel like I'm gonna be learning a few things myself today. Um, so let's start out with introductions. Um, tell us a little about yourselves and your experience in the diversity, equity and inclusion space. Emma, let's start with you. Sure, thanks, Nicole. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Emma Woodthorpe. I'm the Chief People Officer of Brooks Automation. Uh, we are located just north of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we are a global company, so we have employees in uh, Asia and Europe as well as in the US. Um, I've been in the HR profession now for more years than I care to think about. Um, having started my career actually as a recruiter and then spent most of my years, to be frank, in the HR business partner. So working on the ground and seeing firsthand um, kind of the impacts of good employee experience and inclusive behavior and bad employee experience, inclusive behavior. Um, I worked for DuPont for 11 years um, in various HR business partner roles before moving industries and moving into the water industry with a company called Xylem. Um, spent about three years at Xylem before I moved again across industries to uh, Mercury Systems as the CHRO um, and they were a defense electronics company. I would say from a DNI standpoint, um, you know, I've seen it done really well at big companies. But where I see, I've see i seen challenges is at small companies where you don't have the same kind of funding. And so getting really creative around how do you bring DNI to the forefront in companies of about a billion dollars, which is where I've been playing for the last seven years, and really making an impact um, is, is really my experience when you don't have the dollars of a $30 billion company. And how do you do that well and creatively when you're not able to bring everything to the forefront? So spent a lot of time doing that and had some really great wins and some not so good wins, some things that didn't quite go as well. So, um, but really excited to be here. Great, Jason. Hi, just doing a sound check. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Good. Um, so, uh, so excited to be here today. Um, you know, I've lived a couple different lives over the course of my career. Um, I've been a talent acquisition executive with a Fortune 50 organization, um, leading campus recruiting, employer branding, diversity partnerships, and leadership development programs. Um, in that role, I was on our talent management, talent acquisition, diversity, and data analytics leadership councils. Um, I've also led global HR transformation projects for talent acquisition and onboarding. Um, and in that role, participated on the corporate advisory boards of several DEI related professional societies. Um, another turn I've, I've taken as I've talked about these different lives over the course of my career, I then went on to become an industry analyst for Gartner, um, supporting clients and writing research related to the evolving world of talent technology and even help produce a few magic quadrants um, on technology solutions in this space. Um, and yet another turn, I'm currently working on products at Eightfold, um, an HR technology vendor uh, supporting this evolving category of talent intelligence. Um, and I'm also the co-host uh, of our podcast called The New Talent Code, where we talk about topics like this uh, very frequently with a variety of talent leaders. Um, so I've traveled around the HR function uh, from a few different viewpoints and looking forward to the conversation today. Some great background and I'm excited for the different perspectives you're gonna to bring to this discussion. 
So um, Jason, um, since I have you, so what are some practical real life examples um, what you've seen companies do successfully in creating some thoughtful connections with employees? That's a great question. Um, I think there isn't necessarily a silver bullet or one single answer. So most often the success that I've seen comes from improving and tweaking and touching a lot of different areas of the organization, potentially in a lot of different ways. Um, some uh, examples I've seen that have been um, very successful are things like reverse mentoring programs. Um, so we talk a lot about mentoring and um, we talk about you know finding people that you can learn from, but I think reverse mentoring has significant contributions in just generating um, new ways of understanding as well as creating some uh, sense of belonging and, and um, uh, just uh, you know mutual, mutual learning. I've also seen um, some significant efforts made with, as I mentioned, I've been involved in leadership development programs, um, structured development programs that are that are aimed at a specific outcome, maybe even for a specific audience, but that include, you know, the combination of training and learning, but also advisors and advocates. So I think I've seen those have tremendous impact in helping people kind of understand their place in an organization, the potential they have to grow as well as increase some of their visibility and grow their network. Um, another thing that I've seen kind of uh, more recently um, are more like values programs where companies are highlighting, you know, values that they're trying to emulate and show throughout their organization and highlighting people that demonstrate those behaviors at companies. Um, so I've seen this through uh, peer nomination programs and, you know, employee recognition programs where people are exemplifying, you know, certain types of behaviors or values in an organization. And I think, you know, that helps in both creating connection because it's peer recognition, but also in trying to not only change, but champion, you know, the type of culture you're trying to build. Yeah, I love that tie into culture. Anything you want to add to that one, Emma? Yeah, sure. A couple of things. Uh, Jason uh, covered a lot of kind of what I think about in terms of when I look at companies succeeding. But there are, there are a couple of others that I think are really important. And one is just table stakes. And if they're not doing it, you should be, which is really looking at your, your, the candidate states, your talent development programs, you're conducting an equity analysis. If you're not doing it, you should be, um, because that's just basic, um, to be frank. And it's, it's, it's something we can all do. But I think if we want to get to this next level of inclusiveness, uh, of fairness, of equity, we even have to go down into our competency models, um, our leader models and say, look, we build these often because these are the behaviors we want for business. But are we building these for the behaviors we want for an equitable and inclusive work workplace and stepping back and going, you know, is cultural agility something you see in a competency model? I haven't seen it in many but we should, because actually that is inclusive behavior. And so we're taking a step back and going really at the heart of what you're driving behaviors, how are you going to ward, how are you going to develop, how are you going to you know, give feedback, assess. Have you really looked in the core of those, both from a leader and also from an individual? And as Jason said, from a values, and you're going to even you know, have a chance to drive the right behaviors and stepping back and going, is that going to do what we need to? Um, I think the other the other one, and this one is harder, and I've just had a conversation with my DNI leader about this around we've got to look at everything, we've got to look at every policy, we've got to look at every system and say, do we have an equity that's built in? It's just there for whatever reason when these systems were built or you know, in our language, is an equity built in? And actually we've got to go down and stomach we kind of weed that out. That's a much harder thing to do, but where I've seen companies have been really effective, have taken that commitment to go do it. Hard to do when you're a small company for resourcing, but there are ways of doing that. So that's probably what I would add for what Jason just said. And, and Emma, if, if I could just uh, add to that, I think those are all wonderful suggestions and it made me think of another example. Um, you know, we are working very differently uh, in today's world and, and 
trying to accomplish very different business outcomes as our industries are changing and many companies are pivoting or we're trying to address a new set of skills. You know, I was speaking with a talent leader recently, um, Rochelle Snook from WD40, many of you may, may know her. Um, their organization was trying to solve for business transformation during COVID and they had to solve problems that they had never faced before. And one of the things that she, she mentioned that resonated with me was, you know, focusing on the work at hand rather than maybe the the boundaries and the org chart and the functions. And what they built out was they built these teams that were cross-functional and cross you know, departments. Um, but what they did is it resulted on not only addressing the business needs, but it also created better collaboration and visibility and connection and awareness to talent and team members. And one of my key takeaways from having that conversation with her was one of the things that it required was that it required leadership to kind of look at their organization differently and even think beyond like their immediate span of control. And I think one of the one of the outcomes that they saw in trying to accomplish, you know, a business challenge was generating more connection and kind of kind of um, awareness of each other. I thought that was a great example. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> just from my perspective too, I I think there's different layers that of complexity we add in depending on our workforce. So for example, my company um, has manufacturing sites. And so you think about the retail and the manufacturing and those deskless workers and kind of layering that in mm -hmm. <clears throat> with this whole discussion we're having around, you know, the development and the, the you know, capabilities and, and different things that we're looking at. And are we looking at that at all levels and being inclusive of all, you know, personas, so to speak. Um, so really a fascinating discussion. I think we could stick on this um, topic for the whole time, but we need to move on. Um, <clears throat> so I'll take us to the next one. Um, Emma, I think you alluded to some obstacles um, yeah. in your introduction, but what are some of the greatest obstacles to gaining insight into, you know, the engagement, equity, and inclusivity space, and how can HR leaders overcome those obstacles? So I know we're going to talk about insight, but also how to action, because uh, I think that's important. You know, I think our first mistake is saying it's an HR leader's um, problem to overcome. Um, I, I would take, hey, let's strip out HR and put business leader. This is a business problem, not an HR problem. So that's that's the first obstacle I think we give ourselves is because what we don't do, we often and we allow our leaders and our, you know, our senior leaders to say, well, that's off to the side. You know, there's a reason companies have started had, 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 having heads of DNI report to the CEO um, to stop this from happening. Part of, I think, our obstacle is we don't tie engagement, equity, and inclusion to the value creation of the business. And what is it giving the business in terms of where the business is going? Um, and showing those metrics and showing those, I'm not going to into metrics, that's a later question, but I think that's an obstacle that we don't do that. And if we do, and they see the value, you'd be amazed at what you can actually accomplish even by doing that. Um, I think the second one is, this is not easy work. Let's, let's be honest, this is years and years. You know, I've got kids who go, I don't understand why the color of skin matters. I don't understand why gender matters. They're puzzled by this, but yet obviously we're dealing with years of culture, of uh, just national cultures across the world. And so it's not easy and we have to continue to keep moving it forward and understanding we've got to invest in it. And sometimes because it's not seen the value creation, it doesn't get the, the attention. Um, I think the other one is sometimes we move too quickly. We see something like, we're gonna go after that. And without doing a deep dive, because often what we're looking at is symptoms and we haven't got to the cause. Um, and so, you know, I love the five whys. And so when I'm looking for insight, it's like, okay, um, my company, I'm, I'm going to use a prior company, not the one I'm in. Um, we only have 20 leader, 20 women leaders out of 150 leaders in the company. Why is that? And start asking, well, you know, uh, we just can't get them to come. Well, why is that? Why aren't they coming? Well, maybe we're not looking right. And using the five whys to really get to symptoms, uh, the cause of why something's not working and not letting yourself off the hook until you truly understand that and then acknowledging it. But I think sometimes moving too fast to deal with the symptom and not getting to the insight. Um, I think one of the things, especially for smaller companies is not trying to pull the ocean. 
You know, don't try and get insights into everything. Um, you know, you can get very high level just looking at your data and go, okay, where do I need to go get more insight? Because you can get so lost in this topic, you can actually freeze and not do anything. And so you, you, you need to prioritize. And that's where I've seen a lot of companies fail is they're just like, oh my gosh, it's such a big topic and we've got to do all of this rather than going, okay, where's our biggest issue? Where do we need to go after? Is it inclusiveness? Is it equity? Is it diversity? It's not always diversity. And so you're really kind of spending that time and, and really trying to get hone in. That's where I've seen some of the obstacles. That's fantastic. Um, Jason, anything you want to add? Sure. And uh, Emma, wonderful, wonderful uh, examples. I was taking notes as, <laughs> as, as you were providing some of those experiences. I definitely loved, you know, the fact that you identified this is not only an HR problem. You know, talent is a team sport. Right. And even within HR, we're working better and collaborating together and becoming more of a network rather than silos. But in an organization, everyone owns talent. So I think, you know, there's some things around tying the metrics to the outcomes, generating additional transparency, um, avoiding talent hoarding, um, using that data for additional insights. Um, I loved your comment around not chasing shiny objects, right? Sometimes the answer is right in front of us. It's just hard work. And it's actually, you know, touching people and, and reaching out to people and understanding people. It's not necessarily a tool or a product. All that other stuff tends to make tools and products work better. Uh, but if you don't have that culture and that process, you just have a faster broken process. Um, I loved your example of, you know, we have 20 women leaders. Why don't we have more? Why aren't they here? Why aren't they coming here? I think there's a couple ways to look at that as well. It's not just your culture, it's not just your recruiting, it's not just the opportunity, it's, you know, why are they not progressing even past that role? And one of the things that I found in organizations is look at the type of work they've been given, the type of assignments they've had to get to that point. And had they had the right experience to maybe move, move up to the next level or lead a P&L or whatever the case may be, I think Today, you know, part of the challenge we have is that we're trying to identify and gather data from a variety of sources, but we're getting better at that as an HR function. And once we have that data at our fingertips, now we have to drive, you know, an additional level of insights to try to address uh, these challenges. Yeah, I love that. Um, the whole discussion around using data and, and the five whys and just really getting at, you know, what is it that we're trying to solve here? Um, instead of boiling the ocean, right? It, it is, it can be um, overwhelming, I think, um, especially in, you know, a larger company. I know, Emma, earlier you said something about, you know, larger companies have larger budgets, but larger companies also could have more issues exactly. with, you know, um, having too many people working on too many things and having too many different ideas on what's the priority here. I, well, um, I couldn't agree more with that. So yeah. that was no no insult intended. Um, you know, in the small companies, yeah, we have to be a lot more. We we get the advantage to be a lot more nimble often um, because we're not dealing with as many employees, and we can go, let's go do that, let's try it, and fail fast. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, so we did um, touch on or or started to touch on metrics. So let's talk about measures of success for employee experience processes and strategies. We've already had a question come in through the chat about that. Um, so just to circle back to that um, question that came through, I'm trying to get back to it here. Um, how would you properly measure employee performance for employees working remotely? So kind of factoring in with what are the right measures and how do we factor in kind of this hybrid approach and the remote work? Um, so Jason, do you want to kind of start with talking about measures? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at that one. I think what it comes down to is it comes down to, again, driving visibility and transparency to what's asked of people. We need to stop focus, stop focusing on kind of how they got their work done and focus on the work that was completed. Um, if you have more transparency and visibility to how someone is being measured, you then can evaluate them on the work product that they produce. I think when we are in the same space, you know, we look at a lot of other criteria and other 
uh, performance metrics that may not actually be performance metrics or tied to productivity. So I think, you know, there's the blessing and the curse of remote work. One is it requires a different way of managing, but it also potentially allows us to get over some of the things that may influence our opinion or our perception of someone's performance, because now you're more strictly focusing on the work product that's produced. Um, but I definitely think much like anything else, you know, we are only scratching the surface and at the beginning of how we are going to work in the future, right? That we, we are not coming out of something. We are really just starting something. So all, a lot of it is an experiment, um, but people that are going back to the office, people that never left the office, people that are entirely remote, people that are working hybrid, um, I think that also weighs in on how you build this out because you have to develop some type of equitable way of managing all of this work if people are getting the job done differently. And I think, you know, being very open and honest and transparent on the work that's being asked and what's being measured um, is probably the best way to do it. It's not always easy, uh, but it requires, again, like I said, maybe a different approach to, to managing and leadership. Great. Um, Emma, anything to add on the, the measures? I, I couldn't agree more on that one. I think, um, you know, being outcome orientated, I hear a lot of people, by the way, and a lot of HR leaders ask me, what productivity measure can I use? Badge access, you know, all of us, I'm like, stop it. People are being productive. They, they are. And actually, I've cut that word out of our company. I've said, I don't want to hear, apart from in some other areas around people, I don't want to hear that word productivity. It's what were the outcomes we achieved? Did we get the innovation we needed? Did we achieve for our customer and deliver to our customer on time? You know, I talk to my team and say, I don't care actually where you work. What I care about is you get these. These are the things that are objectives. And this is what the outcome I want from you. And if I get that and I, I measure against that, Suddenly people have freedom. They're like, wow, I know where I'm going and I know what I need to do. We're training our managers to do that. This is very new. You're right, Jason, to people who have been able to see their people and can see them, you know, they're staying from seven to seven and, you know, that productivity. It's a mindset shift around becoming more outcome orientated. Yeah, I think that's your, your spot on with that, Emma. Um, and just to, just to add a little bit around this, you know, conversation of measures, um, so, you know, I don't think there's one measure, um, from my experience, it's multiple things that you need to look at to measure, you know, your success with the experience. I mean, you've got the traditional types of, you know, surveys, um, you know, whether it's an engagement survey, a pulse survey, um, satisfaction survey, you know, in the flow of work, right? There, there's a lot of different ways and different places we can pull from. You can be looking at retention, um, recruitment type things, net promoter score, you know, do you recommend your company, you know, all these great things that we can be measuring, but um, really, you know, it kind of gets at um, what's important for your company and, and kind of layered in with that, what you just said, both of you, you know, about being outcome oriented. Um, let's not get so hyper-focused on are people busy? What are the outcomes we're accomplishing? And Nicole, I, I would also just say, as we're as we're going through these different, um, you know, evolutions of work, um, we also need to look at how we evaluate talent differently. You know, very early on, a lot of things were very pr production oriented, production focused. Then we started to move more into talent management and got into performance. And performance includes some elements of behavior. It's not just did you get the job done, it's how did you accomplish it. I think now, you know, especially with a lot of uncertainty or just the pace of change, we also need to look at like the potential. Like what is this person capable of? of where, where, where does this work go in the future? Um, because the future isn't as far away as it once was. Things are happening and changing and evolving much faster. Good point. All right, so let's move on to talking about technology. Um, so what do you see, Emma, in terms of transformative technologies coming in the DEI space? Um, how, how are these technologies going to help us? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one in the DEI space. I, I think um, controversy is coming, has come in with the use of AR and predictive technology um, and really about what, what a bias could be embedded in it because obviously someone programmed it. Um, but I think 
I, it's interesting. I had a conversation the other day with someone about virtual reality. And so what if we could use virtual reality to walk in someone else's shoes? If you could use it to walk in a manufacturing, you know, an assembler's shoes, or even a person of color's shoes and see and have it, you actually have the experience of what that person deals with every day. I've been talked to it, kind of how can we use it to show um, kind of different experience in walking shoes was one thing we're talking about. We're far away from it, but aspirationally, I'd love that. Um, you know, I think um, technologies around connecting, you know, one of the things I find, especially often in global companies is the struggle to connect globally and how do we have technologies and language and, and think about that in, in terms of connecting. Teams is a wonderful tool as long as you use it to connect rather than just use it to silo you and your own groups, but there's others out there. And then, um, you know, last, lastly, um, for me, a lot of this starts, especially from a diversity with my hiring practices. So making sure and using tools that make sure my job, job descriptions aren't biased, that they're written well. Having Actually, I have other people read them as well, but there are things out there that you can use to literally will review your job description and tell you whether it's biased in it or not for what you're doing. So just a couple of high level examples. And Jason, I know you have some you, you, you have some really interesting work going on in this space. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, have, I have a couple examples that I think are really changing the way we address some of these topics, you know, for diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, you know, you mentioned AI, you know, I work for an AI company. Um, we are in the space of this kind of focus area of talent intelligence. I think part of where that comes from is trying to make sense of all of these various data sources that traditionally have been siloed or in different pockets of the organization now where we can actually drive insights and recommendations from them. Um, I also think, you know, not all AI is the same. So people really have to evaluate kind of what the AI does, what outcomes it drives and kind of how the tool works for them. Uh, but a big part of what talent intelligence seeks out to do is really provide additional insights combining a variety of data sets, you know, the industry, your organization, your actual practices. And a big part of that is this conversation we've been hearing a lot about in HR is this focus on skills, right? How do we evaluate skills? How do we store skills? How do we build out skills? And when it comes to DEI, I think a big part of this current focus on skills is being done to try and remove barriers you know, for opportunity based on title or degree or tenure and really focus on like the elements of skills. And does this person have this skill to potentially be considered for this role? Or do they have an adjacent skill that can learn this other role or this other skill relatively quickly? And I think when you start to look at how some of this technology is being used for some of those purposes and you think about skill adjacencies and learnability, what it ends up doing is it ends up expanding the potential pool of talent that you can consider as well as expand the potential career paths for people to consider. So I think, you know, that's one of the new areas um, to potentially explore that people are already taking some advantage of to look at their talent differently and make more informed decisions. Um, I also think just, you know, as someone who's been in this space for a while and studied some of these topics, I'm extremely interested in some of the work that's being done out there around like social network analysis, you know, especially as we're working remotely and decentralized, um, you know, uh, very interested. There was a gentleman, Michael Arena, you may have heard of him. He wrote a book called Adaptive Space, um, and it, it, it uh, examines the role of communication and collaboration on the way work gets done in an organization. And using social network analysis, it visualizes kind of what happens in reality rather than on an org chart. And you can start to see people that have the most what he calls social capital in your organization and really map out and identify how they become the hubs of activity and create tremendous value for your organization. But at the same time, you can also see people that start to become isolated or cut off from the organization or disengage. And I think when we talk about kind of you know, equity and inclusion, especially in these new work formats, you know, tools like this will probably start to grow in popularity. Um, but also it's kind of to focus on the outcome you're using these tools for. It's not for kind of eavesdropping or surveillance. It's on for understanding how work gets done different from how it's designed on paper, right? Jason, I couldn't agree more. I've actually used a tool like that because we wanted to know what was going on in our organization from a connectedness and um, it was something we did with a local with a with a professor at a local university and 
it was fascinating to see kind of where the silos were. And it actually helped us to say, wow, we've got a group that's so far out the organization. And again, we could go ask why. Yep. And we did. And we started to go, okay, well, there's one connection. How do we make more connections? How do we pull them more inside so they feel more connected? Um, works very well with MA, by the way, if you're trying to bring an MA group in and you want to include bring them inclusively to see how you're doing on that. I think that's fantastic. Um, we have to really get away from the traditional tools and processes, you know, and the the way we've been working in the past, and and thinking more along these lines. Um, we want to keep moving here. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to a question on getting stakeholder buy-in. Um, so we do have a question in the chat um, coming through. Um, how can we help convince managers who are kind of digging in their heels about, you know, have to work in the office, you know, didn't like the remote work situation, but but also kind of how do we get the stakeholder buy in to make changes um, for tools, processes, strategies, you know, in that whole, you know, DEI space. So, Emma, I'm going to ask you maybe to start on this one. Yeah, you know, it's certainly a challenge. And I think we've all seen that. I won't name a few CEOs that seem to have this issue of digging their heels and wanting people back in the office. Look, I think, again, it comes back to um, to tying it back to the value it's creating for the business um, and showing data and metrics. There's a lot of data out there right now around, you know, kind of how more engagement. In fact, there are certain engagement companies out there that can tell you right now, engagement scores went up during this time. Um, in terms of people wanting to retain and then went down at the end of COVID because people were tired. So what led to after that? And so, you know, using data to, well, I use a lot of data and say, look, I, I know you want people back in the office, but let's talk about what, what we've seen in other areas or other companies seeing when they make that forced mistake or make that mistake as I think it is to force people back. And let's look at it and then say, look, how far are you willing to go? Let's talk about where are you willing to push it? What would you be comfortable with? And what would you be comfortable testing? And we're in that right now, by the way. My, my CEO isn't completely comfortable with what we're doing, but I've asked him to let's test it and we'll adapt. And we've been very honest with our company. We're going to adapt. And by the way, if you want this really flexible model to work, help me make it work. Flexibility with responsibility. So I just have to have a lot of dialogue, a lot of conversations, data, feedback, engagement surveys more often to give me more data to show what's going on. And actually, I can tie engagement surveys to where my tougher managements are, managers are and see their attrition. And I can actually show on holistic, look, when we did this over here, the engagement, survey, the engagement score dropped and the attrition went up. And by the way, the loss of those engineers actually were a million dollars to the bottom line because I couldn't hire them fast enough for you. We couldn't, you know, we, because the length of time it takes, it took four months. Here's the loss of productivity because of the decision you made. So some of this is tying it together to create the story in the end with harder managers or with, even with the CEO is, it's what is the, what is the impact to the success of the company? Yep, I think Emma hit it, the hit it on the head yeah. with that answer and her, her first answer when she said you really have to figure out how to tie them to business outcomes. But I think part of the challenge is some of the outcomes and some of the problems are things we may ne have never seen before. Um, and there's probably something lurking in the very near future that we can't anticipate. So one of the things that I think organizations really have to get better at is you know, as a former Gartner analyst, we would do, you know, annual surveys of the C-suite. And one of the top challenges that always came up year after year was how long it was taking for them to really know their own talent and know their own people in their organization. Now, I think we're getting better at that. We're getting better at that with new systems and new capabilities and access to data. But I think the challenge now is looking at that data and looking at our talent in a different new way. I mean, um, if you're a leader and you have, you know, a handful of go-to team members, you know, they may be go-to team members for what you're working on now, but you may be neglecting and failing to nurture someone who could be the go-to team member for that thing that's out there waiting to bite you. 
So a big part of this is understanding things like skills and adjacencies and learnability or just understanding different ways of evaluating talent and profiles. So that way, you know, the answer to what you need may already be within your house and you may not even know it and they may walk out the door before you need it. Um, you know, I think there's this, this concept of, you know, people were trying to break down the organization and there was this popul this you know increase in the popularity of the need for talent marketplaces and opportunity marketplaces during covid and the pandemic because i think that's what led to a lot of this organizations were trying to deliver to customers differently maybe changing their business model maybe trying to understand who they had on hand because it was all hands on deck i think that's where a lot of this comes from but it also requires you know a, a completely different way of working and managing you know there's less talent hoarding right more more visibility and then maybe some openness to experimenting and and piloting and things like that you know i can't claim this phrase but uh jason averbrook is a, a popular analyst and thought leader in the hr space and he was saying you know one of the biggest things we have to do is learn to unlearn right and we can't rely on some of the things that got us here to get us to where we're going because it's going to require a lot of different approaches yeah no i think that's that's great um <clears throat> so we're right at time to switch over to q a so I'm going to take a look at what we have out there. Um, so I know we had a question on some creative solutions, maybe for small to mid budget companies. Is there anything that you might offer that um, could be helpful for maybe the smaller or mid sized companies? Jason, do you want to take first or do you want me to? I'll, I'll go. I'll go first. Okay. Um, so my history has been I've tend to work for very large organizations, but now I'm working for more of a, a smaller to midsize company, uh, growing rapidly, but still very small to midsize. I think there are certain things you can do for you know inclusion um, and belonging in organizations like that because maybe you can be more nimble. Or maybe it's easier to get people together. Uh, you know, I'll share with you something that we do in our organization. You know, we have weekly all hands meetings because we're still at a size where we can manage that and do that. Um, and one of the elements of those weekly all hands meetings is we have um, a session every month called the Wall of Fame, where through peer recognition and manager recognition, we nominate people who exemplify values of our culture and our organization. And not only does that help kind of build culture and recognition and belonging, but it also helps kind of drive the culture we're trying to create. And I can just share with you being an entirely remote employee that means a lot to me um, to just feel that sense of belonging, but also see other people recognized even in a very hybrid, remote, decentralized environment. That's one quick example. I'm sure Emma may have some others. Um, yeah, so so a couple of things on here, you know, it's around, especially first of all around diversity, going back to the example I raised earlier about only having 20 women uh, 20 women leaders and actually only 20 women engineers in a highly engineering company um, that, you know, I would say my engineers were 8% and my women leaders were 11%. I went and engaged them. You know, I didn't, I didn't feel I had to go outside and get consultants. I pulled them together and say, okay, does anybody feel like we could do something about this? First of all, why, why is this? And we asked a lot of them. We also asked male leaders as well. And then we said, well, could we do something about this? Could we together make this change in the company through insisting on being into on interviews slates? Um, you know, for ourselves, demanding you know into candidate slates that are diverse. Um, for promoting out there and networking with organizations for women, and we did choose women specifically at this point. And so I didn't try and take this on myself. I didn't have a DNI leader out there. I didn't take this on myself. I garnered the power and the passion of the of people in the company who were hugely passionate about this. I would tell you three days, three weeks, three months, three years later, we had a hundred women leaders in the company and 120 women engineers in the company. So sometimes it's just about garnering and pulling together the power of what you already have. You said it well, Jason, you've already got it there. And so one thing is just to see what's around you and get other people involved. Don't take it on yourself um, if you're a small, a smaller company. Um, 
You know, I think from um, an inclusiveness, uh, uh, we I've done this now at two companies and bought in a peer-to-peer recognition platform um, as a global company. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, you think the cost is more than it actually is, but they're, they're, they're fairly cost, cost effective. I just rolled this out here um, eight weeks ago, and already there have been over 5, 000, 1,600 personal organizations, over 5,000 recognitions in eight weeks, because people love to recognize and include and, and say thank you. And so, you know, it, it, it's not horribly expensive, and it's a way of connecting. And by the way, everyone asked what guidelines we're putting around it. I said, no guidelines. Let's just see what happens. And we'll deal with the odd one that's a little inappropriate. And there's always somebody and someone figured out how to game the point system. We handle those and let the rest do, you know, do the recognition as they feel. It's a phenomenal type of tool. Um, I consider, especially with a smaller company, it's a great way of not having to hand out, you know, American Express cards or anything like that. And so if I would go look at it if you haven't already. I love that <clears throat> no rules approach and no rules. See what see what happens. Um, so let's finish out with there were a couple of questions around managers. So um, either way you want to take this, but uh, one question around how do we um, give managers simple ways to promote DEIB in a natural way, maybe that plays to their strengths. And then there was a second one about. How do we help senior managers um, in succession planning, kind of removing some bias there? So, so either either way, both um, relating to management. If you have any thoughts there, I, I think I'll go first. I think uh, we we are putting more and more on the plate of managers every day, and it, it's the most like there was a there was a question that I think came through on where would you start. Uh, engagement and inclusion exercise, and it would be with managers. I think there's a couple things. Um, we're trying to give them better tools and giving them more access to data. We're trying to influence them looking at challenges differently. Um, but, you know, we also need to care about them too. Uh, one of my biggest learning moments um, working in the talent space was we were generating one of those, you know, structured development programs for early career employees to grow in functions like engineering, where there may be some challenges. And we did an orientation session for the participants. Well, equally as important was we did an orientation session for the managers and talk to them about why this opportunity was happening, what time it would take on their part, how to manage these individuals, what the kind of motivation and incentives were for this. And the feedback was that it was extremely refreshing because in part, they now needed to understand how they were going to manage and oversee this person. But I'll never forget it. The manager said, I really appreciate you taking the time to walk me through this because no one did this for me. Like we kind of missed a generation. And it kind of helps them understand like, the purpose and the intent and builds more community and collaboration. Um, I definitely think representation matters. So like having those women in leadership, I think that has such compounding um, effects. And I've also seen a lot of uh, companies, uh, leadership teams and managers trying to mirror what they're trying to attract. So if you're trying to build a culture that operates a certain way, you know, managers then have to operate in a way that kind of reflects that, what they want to see. Or um, I was talking to a talent leader and their leadership team within the HR function, for example, all rotated positions. And part of it was they were trying to encourage internal mobility and show like, if we can do this, you can do this. And if we encourage it, you know, you should encourage it. I think there's some things like that that can be seen as best practices. Yeah, so, so, so you know, um... I go back to something I said earlier, which is um, unless you look and make sure what managers are being incentivized on, are being developed on, um, your your competency model, um, you're probably not going to get a change. So first of all, do do look at that. Um, you know, from some some sim some um, simple kind of strategies. Um, I remember a, a leader that was a, one of those diehard. I don't, I don't believe in this diversity stuff. I really said that to me. I don't believe it. I said, well, I get that, but we're going to hire onto your team anyway. And so let's look and let's hire the best candidate, but we're going to give you a diverse slate. A year later, he came back to me. He says, I cannot believe the difference in my team and innovation. He said the difference of thought, and it wasn't just women, 
it was a complete right wall diversity across the board he said i was so amazed at the difference and the energy and what we have accomplished because i realized i had been hiring in like and what you opened my eyes to was that by hiring differently I actually got a better result. And so I told him to go tell that story to everybody he could find and evangelize that story. And we used him and we did. We had him talk to a lot of managers about what he did, how he did it, and how it created value, again, for his business. This was a business leader. And so, again, coming down to um, you know, use managers that are showing it to be peer mentors for other managers is one way. Um, you know, encouraging your managers always to make sure everybody in the room or on the phone or on video, mm -hmm. there's every, you're asking for everybody's input. And so everybody feels connected in um, is really important. Spend more time. You know, it's very easy for managers to do that. And rather than giving the answer, just spend the time pulling in easy technique. Um, great book. If you um, is another one is we just I just use this with an executive team. Five dysfunctions of a team. Um, is another great one to look and go, okay, where is an area we need to work more on as a team coming together? And so, you know, there's a lot of different strategies out there. Um, I do think my favorite was having a manager who was a naysayer, turn him into a yes, in, into a yay, and then using him to tell the story of why it was valuable. Wow. <clears throat> this has just been a, a packed session here with so much food for thought. Um, thanks so much, Emma and Jason, for everything. Um, love the ideas we've heard here today and just DEI not being an HR topic, it's a business topic um, and the importance around um, conversations with managers and, and building capabilities there. So um, thanks so much. And um, Michael, we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Nicole, Jason, and Emma. This was a wonderful panel discussion. I also want to thank everyone for joining us today for this fantastic session. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Nicole, uh, Emma, Jason, thank you so much.